Um, this is going to be very different than, this is not a seminar, it's not a conference, it's not a Sunday sermon. I'm not trying to get you pumped up. I'm not, um, my goal is to bring about some education and to help us to learn how to think, to challenge the way you see things. Um, I don't um, want Ministry Training Academy to be the place you go where you're hearing obscure theories. That's not really the goal. There's so much for us to learn that's just in the text, and that's really the goal of what we're trying to build. So we're going to really work on over the next six years as this academy goes on, and I'll explain all that here in a minute, but we're going to work on really helping us to learn the Bible and to learn how to apply it and use it for our ministry and our personal lives and our families. Amen? Amen. I think we need to start off with a prayer. Let's uh, pray together for uh, the next couple days and what we're trying to do. Father, we are just so grateful for times that we can come together like this to learn your word. Amen. We're so amazed at how much treasure you left us in the Bible. It's absolutely amazing the more we read, the more we learn, the more we hear messages, the more we dig how much we realize the depth and the breadth of what you've given us here. Uh, we do pray that over the next two days, it can be a time to really help us to grow in our faith, our convictions, our knowledge, and more importantly than all those things, to grow in our love for you. I pray that we can really have a time where we bond together, where we build new relationships, where we have great conversations, that this becomes a pillar moment, a mountaintop experience for us in our understanding of your kingdom and what you've given us in the Old Testament. I do pray that you really help me to remember everything I want to say. I pray that you uh, also just guide us as we have these discussions and conversations so that it's what you want us to talk about. And I do pray that your spirit is in me, and I pray that your spirit is in every one of us here, helping us to understand your word. And we know that that's what your spirit does. Your spirit gives us insight and wisdom. We pray for that spirit to be empowered in all of us as we humbly sit at your word's feet and listen to what you have to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, so as I was sharing, the Ministry Training Academy is actually going to be 12 courses, and this is going to take place over the next six years. I know that may seem like, wow, is it going to take us six years but I want you to think back on the last six years. If you would have started six years ago, you'd be done, right? Six years, go, six years goes really fast. And the reality is you don't really want to do more than two of these in a year and have another part of your life that actually goes on. And as many of you have realized, just even trying to do the pre-class work for this class, um, it takes a little bit of time, a little effort, right? Amen. I see a lot of heads nodding. So... We're going to go with these 12 over the next six years. So the goal would be that we do one in the spring and one in the fall um, over the next six years. As you can see, the 12 courses that are up there, um, there's no particular order that we're going to do them in. We're going to do them based on what we feel like we want to do, the needs, the availability of teachers, who we're going to bring in, how it works with our schedule, and we'll figure that out as we go. I want to tell you a little bit about the history of the Ministry Training Academy um, around 2009, the teacher's um, service team, which serves our churches around the world, really decided that it was important for us to have some sort of unified plan about what we're teaching globally, especially to those that were in the full-time ministry staff. Now, one of our great strengths in the International Churches of Christ is that we have a deep conviction about discipling. And we've always held up this expectation that our ministers are trained by walking with another minister. And that's fantastic. I mean, that is the Jesus model, and we don't want to ever let go of that. That's always going to be an important integral part of what we do and build. But just because that is the way Jesus did it, it doesn't mean it's the only thing we need. One of the reasons that Paul was such an effective minister of the gospel is that he was trained in the scriptures. He went to... Uh, he had a, quite an education, didn't he? Uh, one of the most trained Pharisees of the day. And that really does help as you're building churches. And we really want to make sure that we're doing a much better job educating our ministers around the world. So the plan and the idea with the Ministry Training Academy was that we wanted to have a curriculum that could be taught to our ministers around the globe because a lot of them don't have some sort of Bible degree. 
And so in 2011, we lived in Johannesburg, South Africa, and we began a ministry training academy there in Joburg. We did the same concept as here. We brought in our ministers. We, had, we have eight different countries in South Africa in that family of churches, and those eight countries of ministers came together, and we also had some of our members join, and we had 80 students, and we began this journey in 2011. And then two years later... Um, actually, the next year, I was in Nairobi, Kenya, and I was sharing with them about what we were doing down in Johannesburg. And they said, well, let's start one in East Africa. So in 2013, we went up to East Africa, and we started the Ministry Training Academy there. We have um, another, I'm sorry, actually in South Africa, there's 12 nations. In East Africa, there's eight nations. And they came together. We had 150 students there in Nairobi, Kenya. And that began in 2013, and that's gone on twice a year uh, over the last three years now. Then uh, in French-speaking Africa, we began the same program last year, and that was interesting, trying to teach. My first class I did was biblical interpretation, and I don't speak French, so I was speaking on one side, and we had a brother translating on the other side for two eight-hour days on biblical interpretation, but it was exciting. We had 62 students that came in um, that spoke French, and that was really fun. So we started that in 2011, and so there's been a lot of people here, and I, I want to commend many of you in this room that have been nudging over the last couple of years, when is our time going to be in Texas? Why do we have these programs in Africa and we don't have it in Texas? Um, some of you harassed me, some people on this side of the room. Um, and so here we are today starting this academy, and it's great. It's going to be exciting. So what's happening here is the program we're going through here is the same thing that's happening now in Abidjan, in Nairobi, in South Africa. So when you move as a missionary to go to Nairobi, Kenya, you can just pick up the MTA there. Uh, amen. When you're an empty nester and you've decided it's time for you to go and serve our churches in Abidjan, then you can go pick up the course in French and uh, you can just carry on from there. Amen. Okay, some of you, um, when you were submitting your papers, had a difficulty logging in. How many of you had a problem logging in? Okay. So for those of you that did have that problem, what we found out was happening when you registered, you were sent an email from the new system telling you that you need to activate your account. If you didn't activate your account, you will no longer be able to log in after a set period of time. And so that's what happened is some of you just didn't either realize that or that email went to your junk mail. And so what you need to do if that's the case is you need to send an email to this email address, admin at ministrytrainingacademy.com. Please don't send me your, um, I don't want to receive your assignment. I want them all to be uploaded there. Um, Ryan Hoke is our administrator for the Ministry Training Academy. I would let you see him up here and put him right here, but he's operating the camera back there. So you can take a look at him. Hi, Ryan. That's Ryan. If you have any questions about anything related to administration with the academy, how to get an assignment in, how to do something on the website, that's the email to send it to or ask him here on the next two days. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, because of that, I realize we're past the deadline. If you submit your assignment sometime between you know, the next 24 hours or so, that's completely fine. We're going to show a little bit of grace this first class. Um, it will... Uh, We'll learn. We'll learn. Okay, so on that note, um, well, let's get to the syllabus in a little bit. Let's start with something more general. What is the priority of the next couple days? You know, the first thing that I really want us to consider and check our hearts about is humility. And you go, well, why do we need to talk about humility when we're sitting here learning? Aren't we humble just by coming to learn? Um, not necessarily. There's a great proverb here in Proverbs 2. It says, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So what do we see our role is in the learning process according to this verse? It's an open question. Yes. Call out. How do we do that in a class environment? 
Raise your hand. Be willing to be vulnerable. Ask questions, even if they don't, you know. You, you, sometimes we have that question that's on our heart, and we go, man, this would be really dumb. Everyone else probably knows the answer to this question. Ask it. We're brothers and sisters. And really what I want to create in this environment is not a one-way just lecture. I want this to be an interactive learning experience. So when you have a question, raise your hand. If I'm in the middle of something and you have a question, raise your hand. I might say, let me take a break in a minute and come to you. But sometimes we may just stop and talk about it, and that's okay. So please make sure that you ask that you are willing to just be humble about where you're at. We have a big variety in here. We've got young Christians in here that are 18 years old, and we've got some of you that have been around for twice that long just been Christians. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that some of you are going to have a lot more questions. And for those of us that are older Christians, this is where humility also comes in. That I realize, you know, you're, there's a lot of the things that we're going to present. You're going to know this already. And that's okay. Please don't be that person who wants to show everyone else in class how much you know. And when you raise your hand, instead of asking a question, you're, well, the way I see this is, we really don't want to have that in class. Amen? <laughs> we're really not here to learn how much you know. Um, we're just here to learn the Bible. So, amen to that? So let's be humble. Let's learn. Proverbs 26. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Amen. That's all we need to say about that. Okay, so how do you learn? And why are we doing the academy the way that we're doing it? Like, why did we have you skim read the Old Testament? And what in the world is skim reading anyway? Right? That, I mean, I've had so many conversations with so many of you about, I don't know how to do that. Um, so one of the great strengths, again, that we have in our fellowship is we read, we see something interesting, we want to dig in, we're taking notes, we break down the verse, we're looking for insight. That is a great strength. But the problem with that is if that's where you live, you often don't see the big picture. And the goal of this class today is to help you see the big picture, to not get caught up in who was king after Ahaz or what happened, you know, to... We're not going to get caught up in those details. We're going to look at the narrative, what's called the meta-narrative, the big picture. What's the big story? So when we assign things in class, doing the work is part of the learning process. So how many of you could actually say, just by sitting down and trying to get through reading the Old Testament, you learned things you didn't know before? Okay, so mission accomplished. Just doing the work helped almost every one of you raise your hand. That is fantastic. So understand that the rigor of actually just buckling down and reading sometimes is worth just being told that's what you need to do. Because by yourself, how many of you would have skimmed read the Old Testament? Like You just wouldn't do it. You don't do it. You just go, well, if I'm going to read the Old Testament, I'm going to do it at least in 90 days, probably six months. If I do it in a year, that's usually really great. And that's, again, that's part of the glory of the structure, the rigor of class. There's going to be books that we may ask you to read through the next six years that you would never pick up on your own, that you would actually don't even like. Like, I've read books that I was told I had to read, and halfway through the book, I'm like, this is nonsense. Why am I reading this? I have no interest in this. And then you find value in it later. Um, so there's going to be a lot of reasons why we ask you to do what you do. Okay, participate wholeheartedly. Uh, when you don't understand, ask. Know yourself and be content. In other words, some of you in here are wired for this, and you just, man, you're like, man, I'm ready. I want to be a teacher. I'm excited. Dave's not going deep enough. we got to do more. I mean, some of you are really wired that way. Some of you are overwhelmed just by sitting down here. And you're going, man, I haven't been in school for 20 years, and I'm freaked out right now. And it's okay. The goal here is not that we all make a 4.0 GPA. It's not the goal. The goal here is to learn. And wherever you are, if you're that person who's overwhelmed and struggling and can't barely figure out how to get through this, if you learn stuff over the next couple days then you win, and be content with that, okay? 
There's others of us that really, this is going to trigger for us an exciting new world that we need to start digging into. And that's great. We want you to do that too. And then the last thing I said is enjoy the puzzle. In other words, these 12 courses, what's going to start happening is you're going to learn things here at this Old Testament class. Then we're going to be sitting in biblical interpretation. And you're going to have flashbacks. Connections are going to start happening. Wait a minute. When we talked about the Old Testament, that, allevi- you know, that helps me understand this. And, oh, now we're doing. And it's all going to start coming together. And it's almost like this jigsaw puzzle that's going to start having pieces put in. And, and enjoy that process. It's really exciting when it all starts coming together like that. But you have to start somewhere. Amen? Okay, so the good, the bad, and the ugly. By the way, there is a ugly animal preservation society that has voted that the blobfish is the ugliest animal in the world. Isn't that something? The blobfish. Okay, so understand, okay, it's an intense process. You will dig. Um, Some of the wells that you pursue are dry. Have you ever decided, man, I'm going to really go after this. I'm going to look at a commentary. I'm going to... And you find there's just nothing here. This isn't, this isn't worth the effort. There's other times you're going to find these veins of gold. You're going to start digging. Like, for example, I don't know if you've ever done this, but studied out Melchizedek. One of the greatest veins of gold in the Bible. And tomorrow, if we get time, we may get into Melchizedek a little bit. Sometimes you're going to find stuff like that, and you just can't wait to tell everybody about it. And, uh, you know, you're sitting there doing discipleship with someone, and you're going, let me tell you about Melchizedek. You know, then that's great. We need to be excited about that. The other thing that happens in this environment, and it's okay, is your faith is going to be challenged. I mean, some of your core convictions might get challenged. And when I became a Christian, I remember one of the things I was the most excited about was the guys told me, look, we really believe in the Bible. We are a Bible church. And if there's something that we do that isn't biblical we're going to change and I go man that's amazing because I grew up in a very traditional background so the idea of actually the church changing because they saw it different in the Bible was very foreign to me but very exciting to me now I really think that over time that's proven true in our fellowship that when we find things that weren't biblical we have changed and that's great that doesn't mean we've got it all figured out yet there's a lot of things that we still have to grow in and change And so some of the things that you're going to learn and study and dig into, you're going to start going, oh, wow, this means we're not doing this right. That's okay. Okay, so let your faith be challenged. And don't freak out. And if you find yourself freaking out, let's talk. All right? We can help. There were days I had, um, how many of you know who D.A. Carson is? Some of you know him? Okay. He's one of the most recognized New Testament theologians right now in the world. Well, he happens to live in Chicago, and he teaches at Trinity University. And so when I was taking in my master's program, I took biblical theology from him at Trinity, and I would drive up every Monday, and I would sit there in class. We had actually about this many students, and we had three-hour lectures every Monday. And I would sometimes leave class, and the first thing I would do is call Steve Staten. Steve is a teacher in Chicago and a good friend of mine. I'm like, okay, Steve, help me out. I'm like... This is challenging how I'm thinking and how I'm seeing things. And I would have these great talks, and it helped me to really develop my own convictions in the scriptures. Okay? So that's great. Um, If you feel a temptation to quit, please come talk to me. All right, let's talk about the schedule. Pretty generic schedule here. Basically, we're going to work for three and a half hours in the morning, three and a half hours in the afternoon. Um, We're going to take a two-hour lunch break for two main reasons. Number one... There's not a lot of restaurants right here. You're going to have to travel 10 minutes or so to find food. Number two, you're going to need a mental break. And just get some good fellowship and enjoy each other. Get a good cup of coffee, take a siesta, and then come back um, so that we're ready to rock and roll. I would ask, and you guys, I'm so proud of you this morning. Fantastic job being here on time. I mean, really, really well done. I appreciate that effort. Let's do the same for all these sessions. Uh, 2 o'clock, let's be ready to go, seated, so that we can rock and roll. And that's why we gave you a good, generous uh, break. I'm hoping today that we will probably end a little bit before 5.30. Um, Some of you have to travel and come back tomorrow, so we'll see if we can accommodate and get done a little bit earlier. But we will never go after, not a minute after 5.30, ever. Amen. Okay. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about this class and the syllabus. 
So everybody should have a syllabus uh, in front of them. I'm going to give you a, an important piece of advice. And I know this is kind of counterculture for us. In the ICOC, we make n- announcements about things at nauseam. Like, if there's a conference coming up, we're going to tell you about it ten times. We're going to put it on the website. You're going to probably get an email and, you know, someone might even tap your shoulder and say, are you registered? We're not going to do that in the MTA. We're going to follow the syllabus. What that means is when the professor sends you the syllabus or whoever's teaching that class, everything you need to know is going to be on that syllabus. But what that means is that we expect that you actually read it. So what's funny is I've probably had 10 questions emailed to me. Dave, what's the address of the church building? It's on the syllabus. What time do I need to be at class? It's on the syllabus. When will class be done? It's on the syllabus. Um, Where do I send my assignment? It's on the syllabus. You know, so please refer to the syllabus, read through it, and then if it's not there and you have a question, please feel free to ask. But let's head off. We can head off a lot of those questions because it's on the syllabus. Amen. Great. Um, I want you to pay attention here. If we turn to the back, let's look at course requirements. You had reading assignments. Um, what I am going to do is, let me make a comment here on our reading assignment. I know that many of us signed up later. We didn't understand the amount of work that it was going to take coming into this class. We're usually going to have a two-month uh, cutoff, so we'll do registration. We'll give you six weeks or so probably to do the work, so the registration cutoff will give you plenty of time to do whatever is required of you. This is our first run at this. Some of you found yourself scrambling because we may not have planned really well, and that's going to be part of the process. You're going to have to really plan uh, and partition your time so that when you show up, you can be ready. So I want to give you a little grace on the reading. For those of you that are full students, I want you to still finish the reading, but I'm going to give you another week to do that. Okay? And so when I give you the exam... You're going to fill out a little thing that says, what percentage of the reading did you do? And it'll be by a week from today. So whenever a week is from now, you can finish up and you'll be able to say 100% if you finished up. Okay? So we're going to do that for this class because it was new. In the future, we won't do that. But we'll do that here today. Um, Skim reading. When you skim read something, you know, there's kind of, there's three levels of reading. There's like reading and reading and reading. Reading when you first are exposed to new content, you're having to, it's like a a labor. You're having to pay attention to a lot of details of what's going on. And let's say you're reading a book on woodworking. You've never picked up a hammer before. It may take you some work to really read so that you can understand what's being said. Now, after you've started woodworking for a while and you've read one or two books, you're picking up books differently. You're picking up books that are new books, and you're, you're reading to find new material, things you haven't read before. Oh, I've read that. I know how to do uh, a dovetail joint. I haven't, oh, that's a new concept I've never read, and I'm going to read that. And so that's, that's kind of a different level of reading. Then there's the level of reading that you've already read something before, you know it, and you're refreshing. And that's skim reading. Skim reading is you know, you're kind of thumbing through, okay, and yep, I remember that story. Okay, I don't remember that story. Let me fresh up on that, okay. You're moving because you know the material. And that's what was intended for the Old Testament. Many of you have read the Old Testament many times, and so the idea was just brush yourself up, freshen. If you had never read it, it was probably good for you to do a little bit more reading. You may have been at that first category more of reading. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions about that? Great. All right. Um, Pre-class assignment we talked about. um, The project we'll talk about at the end. The final exam we'll talk about at the end. Look at number five on your syllabus, formatting and grammar requirements. Um, One of the things that's going to be really important is how you actually lay out your papers. Um, One of the things I don't want to see, I don't want to see color. I don't want to see fancy fonts. I don't want frills around the edges of papers. 
Um, really, all we're looking for is content. And so the idea of everybody following the same format, times Roman numeral, 12-point font, one-inch margins, double-spaced, everything you turn in will be like that. Because what that enables our teachers to look at is just content. What did you learn? That's what we want to know. And we don't want to be distracted as you're grading 150. Well, you're not grading that many papers. It's about half of that for full students. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why we really want you. And it's good for us just to follow instruction and know how to do that. Okay, how do I actually just format a paper properly? I encouraged everybody to have someone proofread their papers. Um, turning in a paper that you wrote without having someone else look at it isn't going to be your best work. When someone looks at it and they go, what did you mean by that? Or your grammar needs some help here. Or that argument doesn't make sense to me. It's not that it's changing your work into someone else's work. It gives you a new opportunity to do a better job with your own work. So get in the habit of having somebody find a partner, pair up, and do that. Okay? I think that's it. Any other questions on the syllabus? Oh, full students and audit students. Let me explain this so this makes sense to everybody. If you're a full student, that means you're doing the assignments, you're turning them in, you're getting marks graded, um, you're taking it for a grade. An audit student, you're not required to do anything. You don't even have to look at the syllabus except for when to show up. And you come and you just sit here and you learn and you walk away and you're done. That's it. So that's the idea of audit students. We have a new possible option that we're looking to offer in the next year. We had an interesting conversation with a brother, Glenn Giles, who is starting to work. He's got a master's level program that's affiliated with Lincoln Christian University. We talked to him about the possibility of offering a master's level credit from our MTA. What that would mean is, let's say, um, I know Nate's interested in this. Let's say Nate Bigby signs up in that third category as master's student in this class. What that would mean is that there would be a PhD, which I am not, um, somebody like Glenn who oversees his work. And before class, he would have additional assignments. He would come to the class with everybody else and he would learn the same material. And then afterwards, he would do the work at a master's level. He would have a different exam. He may have some different you know, projects he has to work on. And that would all be handled by a PhD. So he would participate in class with everybody else, do more work than the average student, and at the end, get three credit hours of master's level work that would apply to any master's program that would be affiliated with Lincoln Christian. Does that make sense? That's pretty exciting, isn't it? So we're working on that. We're going to see where that goes. Um, if we do that, you're going to pay more than $80. Um, you would have to you know, pay the equivalent to facilitate having that PhD oversight and what that would cost. So we don't know what that's going to mean yet. We don't know when it's going to be yet. It's just an initial conversation that we're having. Okay. Any other questions about the class structure before we dive in to material? Okay. We're going to break up um, today into three main classes. The first thing we're going to talk about is the reason the reason why we're studying the Old Testament, um, you know, it's pretty... Fa How many of you enjoy the Old Testament? How many of you honestly just, it's not your thing, the Old Testament? Okay, great, it's all right. No problem, hopefully we can convert you by the end of class. Um, you know, there's, we, we have a lot of fun by the, in the Old Testament. You ever seen this cartoon? Moses sitting there taking a bath, his mom yelling at him, stop that, take your bath. Isn't that great? How about this one? When Moses gets older, he's fishing. You know, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's. We've had a lot of fun with the Old Testament. Uh, there's so much there. It's deep. There's so many ways to approach it. Um, and most people usually have one or the other. You either have this, man. I just love the Old Testament, or I just don't ever even read it unless I have to, you know. Um, so what I want us to start with is this idea of the meta narrative that we talked about. How would you tell the story? I mean, the Old Testament, 39 books, lots of different authors covering huge periods of time, 
So many kings and names and places, laws, specifics, details. And you, you, when you consider in the Old Testament even the types of um, literature in it, I mean, you've got everything from law to Hebrew narrative to psalms to wisdom literature to apocalyptic literature. To, I mean, it's, it's like all in there. And you're reading it, and you're like, man, this, is, this flows. And then you get to Leviticus, and you're like, you know, struggling through, just trying to even stay focused. And then you get to numbers and you're reading about the thousands of troops and what tribe had how many where, and you're like, really, why does this matter? And, you know, sometimes that's what happens. But when you, you step back and you look at this meta narrative, you go, okay, how would you tell the story? What happened? Well, here's one way to tell the story. There's a really quick, like, minute-long version of the story uh, in a video that I want to show you. The audio is not very good here, but um, I think it's good enough that you can understand how these guys tell the story. One, two, three. By the way, the men that Earth made Adam Eve. Can we get more volume on that? Let me start over. Here we go. One, two, three. By the way, the men that Earth made Adam Eve. Angel Gable has to leave. Boring genealogy, gray and blood, olive leaf, Tower of Babel, Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Isaac Jacob built of Moses, Ten Commands, Promised Land, Judges gave to Solomon, sent away to Babylon, Job, then a bunch of stars, Rip Proverbs, and the Song of Sir, Rip. Major Prophets, Lion Den, Minor Prophets, Bethlehem, Golden Merlin, Brink of Sand, Satan and Samaritan, Two Disciples of the Chief, Walk on Water, Thousand Feet, Lazarus of Baby Tree, Last of Work of Money, blood, money, dirt, and now, Pontius Pilate, public trial, 40 lashes to the tree. Why have you forsaken me? Third day, empty tube, reappear, five moons, act of the apostle, check the purple by the apocalypse. Whoa! That's one way to tell the story, right? Um, let me ask you when you read the Old Testament, could you summarize in one sentence what's the story of the Old Testament? Who wants to give it a shot? What would you say? Yes, sir. I would say God desired fellowship with someone other and went through an enormous process to create and refine that partner. Okay, okay. Let's keep working. Who else? Give it a shot. I mean, one sentence. How would you describe it, Rhett? God reaching out for relationship with his creation. Okay? What else? The history of man's relationship with God. The history of man's relationship with God. And was it a good one? <laughs> it's interesting. Okay? What else? What's one sentence that describes the Old Testament? Yes, sir. It's God working through people to prepare the world for the coming of the Son. Okay. God working through people to prepare the world for the coming of his son. All right? Jeff? God creating and redeeming his family. God creating and redeeming his family. Okay, so there's key elements here that we're picking up. Certainly, God's pursuit of mankind is a huge theme, right? I mean, it's all over the place. He creates us, and he is striving to have a relationship with us, and, and it's as if... I mean, it's just this horrible story. You're like, you're rooting for the underdog, and they keep failing. Like, seriously, can you not get it? And over and over and over and over again. And so we see God building this, um, this crescendo. It's like this buildup of a solution that's going to come that's going to fix everything. And that's really what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is like one huge crescendo into the coming Messiah. We're going to talk about that a lot. Um, redemption, that's a huge part of this, right? Because we keep blowing it and God has to keep fixing our problem over and over and over. Anything else? Any other main mega themes that you see standing out? Yeah, Gabe? God's grace, his compassion. One of the words that is used to describe God's character, which I love and is very clear in the Old Testament, long-suffering. I mean, God's patience is just 
unbelievable. Okay, what else? Yeah. A picture of? The completeness of his emotions. I love that. Okay, so you do. You see God angry, compassionate. You see him empathetic. You see his mercy. You see it all. And it's true. We really get a picture of the character of God in the Old Testament. Very good. This is why I like class participation. You get great insights. Okay? Yeah. The history of the people of Israel, and it was an interesting one. Okay? Great. Okay, so, you know, in your assignment, I asked you to write in 100 to 200 words the story of the Old Testament. Uh, did, you find that inter- did you find it challenging? How do you summarize everything that happened in 1 to 200 words? And why did I limit it to 200 words? Because we want to use 4 or 5 or 6 or 2,000 words And it actually makes us think to to bring it down to, okay, how do I tell the story in a shorter period of time? Now, when you look at the story of the Old Testament, there's a lot of different lenses that you can use. And I like that word lenses because it it talks about how you see things. So, you know, have you ever put on a pair of some kind of glasses that changed the way things looked? Like polarized lenses. Do any of you like to fish? When you fish... Wearing polarized lenses is really important. Why? Because the reflection of the water doesn't blind you, and it helps to change your perspective. What we're going to talk about in this class are different lenses we can wear to see the Old Testament differently. And what I don't want this class to be, I don't want it to be a survey book that you can pick up and go, okay, Dave is just going through the background and history of all the books in the Old Testament, and you've got a book on your bookshelf at home that could do the same thing. The goal here over the next two days is actually to help you see things that you can't normally see. And hopefully that can happen a little bit. We're going to talk about these three possible ways of seeing the Old Testament. One is the national development of Israel. The story of God building a nation for himself. And how did he do that? We're going to spend a lot of time on that concept here this afternoon. Another way that you can actually look at the Old Testament that's completely different, that has nothing to do with the nation necessarily, is through the seven promises to Abraham. The seven promises of Abraham that God gave in Genesis actually outline the entire Bible. And we're going to go through those seven promises tomorrow, and we're going to talk about how it outlines all 66 books of the Bible and how that works. So that's a whole different lens. That is... That's not a lens necessary of history. It's more of a lens of promise and God's fulfillment and God being smart enough, foreshadowing, seeing everything omnipresent in order to actually facilitate what he wants to happen on this earth. It's very faith building. Another way that you can look at the Old Testament is something we touched on here earlier is salvation history. Now, when you say that salvation history, what that means is From Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve blew it, the story of the Bible is redemption. And from that moment until Revelation 22, God's goal was to fix what happened at the garden to bring us back into paradise with him in heaven. We start in the garden. We end up in the city of gold. We're there with God in his presence and everything is perfect and good and we end up back in God's presence with everything perfect and good. And that story from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 22 is what we call salvation history as it unfolds step by step. God is bringing about redemption for mankind over a long period of time and God was driving that process All the way since the Garden of Eden. It's another way of looking at the Bible. Okay, so you remember this passage where the disciples are standing there, or these two disciples are walking along with somebody else, and they start having this conversation on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. It says in verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them 
what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So who was this figure that was walking along with these two men? You know the story, right? It was Jesus. And Jesus is telling the story of himself, of Jesus, using the Old Testament. He's using the crescendo. He's using salvation history. He's explaining to these two men that he is the fulfillment of everything that has happened up until now. And hopefully today, what you're going to learn today and tomorrow is how much that's true. That everything that we read in the Old Testament was building up to this monumental figure, Jesus Christ, the Messiah on earth. Everything ultimately is about Jesus. Everything. The tabernacle is about Jesus. See the tabernacle up here? If you don't get a chance over the next couple days, come up and take a look at the tabernacle. We're going to spend an hour on that tomorrow and talk about all the ways that foreshadows Jesus. All the prophets, all the history, all of the, pre, the priesthood, the kingdom concepts, the, the, um, the kingship, all of it led to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And that's what these men started understanding. And as it started happening, that they're, it's almost like their scales were falling from their eyes. It says, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened up the scriptures to us? And that's when you know, right? That's when you know that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart. You're reading things and you start feeling this excitement, this burning, this enthusiasm, like it's coming to life. I get it. And hopefully you'll have a few of those aha moments over the next couple days. We have to know the story. Why do you think, before I jump into those verses, why do you think it's so important to know the story of the Old Testament? Okay, fantastic. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but that's what Jesus used. You know, the Bible of Jesus was the Old Testament. Now, they didn't call it the Old Testament, did they? What did they call it? The Scriptures, the Hebrew Canon. Um, okay, so that, that was the Bible of Jesus. It was the Bible of the New Testament, or the New Testament church. You know, I don't know if you knew this, but, you know, in... 100 A.D., 150 A.D., they didn't have first principles like we have them, right? There was no discipleship study, no word study, no L and D. They didn't exist. Now, really rock your world. The New Testament wasn't canonized until probably in the 300 A.D.s. That meant for the first couple hundred years, the Bible of the New Testament church was the Old Testament. Okay? What else? Okay, it validates God's authority and who he is to us in relationship. Great. Sunil? We have to know where we came from. Why is that so important? Why do we need to know our history? Because if you don't know your history, what happens? You repeat it, right? The more you know about your history, the more you can try to prevent, try to prevent it from happening all over again. Okay, why else do we need to know our story? It clearly lays out the need for redemption. Okay, it helps us understand our need for redemption. I think so much of our story is one with so much promise and prophecy, and it's extraordinarily faithful in it, but I think it's also one of the biggest pieces of evidence for God. There's eight centuries before we're reading about It's great. It's mind-blowing, it's faith-building, you see promises fulfilled, you see God at work, you see him working through people's faithlessness, you see him always coming through, God always wins, God's always the victor, God always is the one who's going to come out in front, always. And even when it doesn't look like he's there, he's there, right? And that's what you see over hundreds of years, God, where's God? God's there, he's waiting for things to unfold. God is always there. So what does that do for us? Faith-building. The more we know the Old Testament, the more we see the story, the more we wrap our head around what's going on, the more faith we have. Like, oh, God is faithful. God is patient. I mean, even when you're processing your own character problems, man, I blew it again. And you go, God is patient. God is merciful. God is amazing. God still loves me. 
right? It helps the more you know your story. Psalm 78, Acts 2, Acts 7, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. These are moments in the biblical record where the author was using the history to make a point, to come to conviction, to build faith. Psalm 78, it's this incredible psalm walking through what God did to rescue his people, how it worked, what it brought about, the transformation of Israel. And it's all in there. It's all there. So you're reflecting on this and you're going, man, God is awesome. Acts chapter 2, who, was, who preached the sermon in Acts chapter 2? Peter. And how did Peter connect the dots for his Israelite brothers and sisters? He told the story. Let me help you understand. You're part of this incredible meta-narrative. You play an important role in it. We're at a pivotal point in history in it, but we didn't just show up. This isn't just some crazy guy standing on the street in Jerusalem enabled by the Holy Spirit saying, we're starting something new. We're part of something on the global cosmic scale. And it started with our father Abraham. And let me tell you how you fit into that story. Same is true for us, isn't it? Let me, let me just debunk another myth. We did not start in 1979. You are part of world history. Abraham is your father. Moses, your brother. David, your brother. This, your history doesn't go back a decade or two. Your history goes back to the beginning of God's creation. And you have been part of that plan since the inception of the universe. It's a very different way that we need to see things than the brief history that we often mess up. Acts chapter 7. Stephen, standing in front of his persecutors, telling the story with confidence of who he is. And why could Stephen stand there and preach with such depth of conviction? He was so rooted in his story. He knew who he was. He wasn't afraid of what was about to happen. He didn't mind that he was going to be stoned to death because he knew what he was part of. You're not just part of the Austin Christian Church. You're part of God's people, God's kingdom. And when you know that, the, thing, the world around you, it doesn't shake you. That's right. And then, I mean, the book of Hebrews is just amazing. The Hebrew writer, and it's like one of the only books we don't know who wrote it. The, the book of Hebrews written, piecing together all these glorious things in the Old Testament and bringing them into this new covenant and helping us to understand, look at all these amazing things God was doing for you and I to prepare you for this new covenant that you're part of. Blessed are those whose eyes have seen. And you and I have an opportunity that didn't exist. Really, I mean, the way it exists now, it hasn't ever existed. When the printing press came about, the fact that you and I are sitting here with the entire corpus of scripture right here we got it all we live in one of the most blessed times in history we got to know our story all roads lead to christ matthew chapter 13 but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear for truly i tell you many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but they didn't see it and to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. I mean, how hard would it have been? You ever try to put yourself in these guys' shoes? What would it have been like to be Abraham? To be the only guy hearing voices. I mean, do you think Abraham just sometimes sat there and goes, I, am I crazy? Nobody else knows about this God. I think that's why he was so fired up when he met Melchizedek. Take tenth of everything I got. You know about God? That's amazing. You know, he had to be super fired up that someone else was hearing the voices. <laughs> Moses. I mean, 
coming after having to leave your country that you grew up in because you really blew it trying to fix a problem. 40 years as a shepherd coming back because God told you to go back and the people that you're trying to rescue hate you. And they're angry at the plan that God has given you. Pharaoh's angry at you. The Israelite elders are angry at you. Everybody's mad at you. And you're hearing the voices. And you don't have all this. We're blessed. Romans chapter 10. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. You know, part of the thing that we take for granted, it's just so easy in this modern world to just go, oh, I just need Jesus. And yes, that's really all we need, but we need to understand why it's all we need. Like, we need Jesus because he's a culmination of everything that God had laid out beforehand. And we need to appreciate and understand all that, or we don't really understand how much we need Jesus. We're going to spend some time today talking about Genesis 3 in great detail. If you don't understand Genesis 3, the fall, you never fully appreciate why you really need Jesus. And that's why that's such a pivotal passage for us to study out. John chapter 5, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. You see how Jesus says that? He's talking about the Old Testament and he's saying, what's it all about? It's all about testifying to the Messiah. And he's saying, you're missing the point. If you don't understand that the point of the Old Testament is the need for a Messiah, you're missing the point. There's so much value in the Old Testament. Why do we have the law? Paul says we have the law so that we might understand sin. Well, you go, man, I'd be a lot better off if I didn't understand sin. I, don't, I disagree. Because what happened with me when I became a Christian and I did the sin study is I started realizing why my life was so broken. It wasn't broken because I was unaware of sin. It was broken because I didn't understand that I was offending God in what I was doing. And if I didn't do those things, my life would be so much better. So the law actually serves us to show us what happens when we aren't doing things right. Salvation history, we talked about that already. What is that? That is the redemption plan. So the reason why we need the Old Testament is to understand this plan of redemption that God had marked out before the creation of the world. Promises being fulfilled. We see that happen throughout the Old Testament. The character of God, we talked about that. Uh, that's what we see by studying the Old Testament. A foundation for Christ. Uh, we saw that we've already talked about that. Let's look in Hebrews 10 and verse 1. I love, this is one of my favorite verses in Hebrews. It summarizes this, all that we're talking about here, about the power of the Old Testament. It says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. You know, a shadow is an interesting thing. I mean, I have one up here. If that's all you knew of Dave Pachta, You know, you go, that's not very impressive. It's a little short. <laughs> um, but can you imagine? I mean, we live in a two-dimensional world, and that's all we know. That's all the Old Testament people saw. They saw a shadow. They just saw these images. They would see these moments. They would get these reflections of what is God doing and we stand here and it's like when Jesus came and, and all got written down we have this 3D in color full dimensional view of the whole thing it's incredible so what are we going to do over the next couple days here's our approach we're going to start with our next section here on the canon we're going to talk about how did we get the Old Testament how did it get compiled? How do we know we can trust it? So that'll be our next class here. Then we're going to talk right before lunch about Genesis 3, the fall, 
And we're going to spend a, a good hour just in that text and do some exegesis just in that section. Then we'll take a break for lunch, um, and we'll come back, and we're going to spend our afternoon on the story. Now, if you have in front of you this, did everybody get a book? Okay. When I started teaching this class in South Africa, I was looking for a resource that captured everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we had a very talented graphic designer that I was working with, and we created this book for this class. So just so you know, you're not going to get a nice colored book like this for every class, but you get one for this class. Okay, so if you look, um, there's a timeline. I think it's the first full page after the table of contents. You see that? This is a very simple version of that meta narrative and how that story unfolds. And what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to go through this meta narrative and we're going to look at this from that lens that I talked about of the development of a nation. And we're going to use this chart this afternoon to do that. So that'll be our afternoon today. Then if you turn the page, a couple pages to the promises, tomorrow morning we'll begin with the page that says the seven promises to Abraham. And we'll open up tomorrow morning studying out the promises. And then we're going to get into the tabernacle, which again, make sure you come up and take a look at. Uh, there's a whole other page in here on the tabernacle we'll work through. And then what we're going to finish with tomorrow is the Christ Meaning, how is Jesus in the Old Testament and all the different ways that he's in there? So that's our plan over the next couple days, okay? And uh, we'll use all these different charts and diagrams um, as we go. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a 10-minute break. Actually, that's probably a little generous. Can we do a five-minute break? And then when we come back, we're going to jump into the canon um, so let's take five, let's be back, keep an eye on your watch, go. Go.